Thank you, Claire. What, a, what an amazing event this is. I have to say, I've been working in hearing loss prevention for most of my career, over 30 years, and I have never seen a room like this where such a diverse group of people have come together where prevention is part of it. So I really compliment you on having such a vision to not only look at clinical services, but look at prevention and see how those can come together. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm going to give you a flyover about dangerous decibels today, but, but the reason that dangerous decibels was created was to address what Claire has alluded to. We have um, a problem with noise-induced hearing loss in our society, and it's a worldwide problem. Um, I've looked for some statistics for the UK, but I wasn't able to identify the same types of statistics that I'm able to get in the US. We have what's called the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, where uh, there's a systematic way we look at hearing loss across the population, and, and I know Adrian Davis has done some work in this area here, so he may have more information than I do, but I, I doubt our statistics are too terribly different. But for young adult, young adolescents, we're looking at somewhere around 15 to 16 percent have hearing loss. They have indications of a high-frequency hearing loss um, as a teenager before they've even gotten into the workplace or um, had a lifetime of noise exposure. Um, tinnitus, or the ear ringing or buzzing that we get with hearing loss or even without hearing loss, is one of our early indicators. And we have evidence that this is showing up in kids as well. Um, it's not something that's just restrained to adults. Um, Howard Hoffman and a group in the U.S. have just published as of last December. I don't know if you've seen that article, Adrian, but it's a great um, snapshot of hearing in the U.S., and these are some statistics out of it. They were able to look at speech frequency hearing loss and high-frequency hearing loss that may be more indicative of noise. And it looks like somewhere between 29 to 57 percent of adults have, have uh, of the workers have hearing loss that we may attribute to noise. Um, people who don't work all day long in noise also have a high prevalence of hearing loss, 37 percent. Um, and then an area that I, I work in is related to impulse noise or firearm noise exposure. And 32 to 50 percent of adults that shoot firearms have hearing loss. Um, the good news in the U.S. is the statistics overall actually look like hearing loss is declining a little bit. But in the area of noise, we still have a major problem that affects millions and millions of folks. Um, I found a, st a statistic that noise-induced hearing loss is your fifth most common occupational injury in the UK, and Claire's already alluded to the costs that come along with that that aren't just financial. They cost you in your relationships and in your job opportunities and things you have along the way. So um, I, I pulled out, I, I was able to read your action plan on hearing, and as I said, impressed by the fact that prevalence or prevention was in that uh, document, and that you specifically also pulled out military personnel and workers that are noise exposed on the job. And Dangerous Decibels is working in both of those populations right now in other parts of the world. So there is a connection between kids and workers and the military in what Dangerous Decibels does. So, um, so what is Dangerous Decibels? It's a, a program that has many arms that was decided to focus on the prevention of noise-induced hearing loss and tinnitus. Uh, it began in 1999, and we have a host of different activities that I'll highlight here in a few minutes. Um, I think one of the things that makes Dangerous Decibels different is it's not a campaign. This isn't a marketing approach to try to sell that good hearing is, is good for you. It is actually a health communication strategy to try to begin to change knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors that will carry you through your lifetime and help you have healthy hearing. So it's, it's based in science, and we learn continually evolving it and trying to make it more um, effective in, in changing those things. Um, we have materials that are used in all 50 states in the U.S. territories, and over 40 countries um, are using at least pieces of the Dangerous Decibels program. Dangerous Decibels is not a company. It's not a nonprofit. It's not. We purposely designed it so that it can be people that come together with a passion for hearing loss prevention, 
can be trained and use our tools and then take them back to their communities where they can best use those and apply them. So um, right now we have a group of universities where we have people from public health, from industrial hygiene, from hearing science, from audiology, from medicine, from nursing, all contributing into the program along the way. And we have key contacts in several countries that work together with us. So the activities that we have, um, we had, originally we had a, a large museum exhibit at the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. It was there for 10 years and visited by over uh, half a million people. And that was a very unique way to do some hearing loss prevention training. Some of those exhibits were also sent out to um, our local fairs and festival events. Uh, the K through 12 program I'll talk about a little bit in a minute. And then um, online is what we call our virtual exhibit. There are games and, and interactive educational things um, on the website. Uh, we put on an educator training workshop, which I'll tell you a little bit more shortly about. And we do public health research. And um, we have an um, activity called Jolene. And we didn't bring Jolene. She couldn't make the trip, but Joe, for now, <laughs> is here. And uh, this is an educational mannequin. You make them, dress them up, have some fun with them, and we use them to help do outreach about music player listening levels. So at break, if any of you have your, your music on your phone and you have your earphones with you, if you come up, I'll tell you how loud you're listening and how long you can listen to your music with it at. It is probably the only thing I've used in my lifetime where someone comes up to me and asks me what I'm doing and gives me the opportunity to teach them about hearing loss prevention. Otherwise, we're always trying to drag people into the topic. But this arouses curiosity and um, has been lots and lots of fun to use. So um, the, the original classroom program is a 50-minute program where we engage um, the attendees in some interactive activities to um, communicate the health messages related to prevention of noise-induced hearing loss and tinnitus. Um, there's been additional research and development over the years, so we've delivered the program with parents, and we get better carryover and long-term effects when parents are involved. Um, we also have... Um, done some work with training high school students to train the younger kids. Um, there's something, you're a rock star if you're a high school student and you go into the elementary schools and train the kids. And if there's an interesting thing about high school students, they're hard to reach to get them to embrace hearing loss prevention. But when they have to teach younger kids, they don't want to be hypocrites and they change their behavior so that they can be effective teachers. So I think it's a unique way to get to that adolescent uh, group. Um, in New Zealand, Ravi Reddy and David Welch have been working um, on adapting the program and doing the science related to the workplace. So we now have peer-reviewed literature uh, supporting its application with adults in the military and um, in the workplace. And then our more recent work in the U.S. has been to work with some of our indigenous um, tribal communities in the Pacific Northwest, so the American Indian uh, groups that we put dangerous decibels in the schools, but also built it bigger out into the community so that when you went in to um, buy noisy equipment, there was also earplugs near that equipment. We talked to the stores and newspapers and radio stations and made a lot bigger community effort uh, to implement the program, which has had some much longer carryover um, when you have a community-based approach. In New Zealand, the, the program's actually taught to all the incoming military recruits and the officers there. So how did we accomplish this? Well, um, no one gave us millions of dollars and said, please go forth and spend it. Uh, they, uh, we've applied for many, many grants through our federal granting agency, private foundation grants, uh, corporate grants. We um, have done this in other countries where we've been able to identify research that needs to be done or outreach that needs to be done and access funds that way through it. We've also partnered with some um, corporations that have helped sponsor workshops, uh, 3M helps us get earplugs into the program to use in the schools or in the training programs. 
So it's really a matter of people coming together and deciding how we can make this program proliferate within the, the local communities. So I mentioned it's evidence-based. Uh, we have multiple peer-reviewed scientific articles that have been published from early on and continue to be updated depending on which of the, the populations we're working with. Um, Kayla Knobel in Brazil replicated our US studies and got the same sorts of outcomes there. And the same thing, as I mentioned, has been happening in New Zealand, both with children and adults. So we're really excited that what we've done in the US seems to be translating to other countries and communities there. So those uh, references are, are there for those of you interested in more of the uh, peer-reviewed publications. So who benefits from this program? Well, it's anybody that attends one of our activities. It can, it's children and their families. We teach the program to nurses, school teachers. It's designed so that once you come to a training workshop, you're equipped to go out and deliver the program to your target audience. Um, so you can see here the list of people that have come and attended it. Um, so uh, even, even organizations like, um, you know, 4-H or Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or if you have other youth groups, we've been able to engage with them. So a little word about the um, training workshops. So we've gone to Brazil and New Zealand and uh, we recently just did a workshop in Southeast Asia. So as we've helped um, this grow into other countries, we not only put on the training workshop, which is a two-day workshop that gives you a kit all the materials, you're ready to go to deliver the program the next day after the workshop ends. But we've also trained a core team of um, instructors within these countries so that they can continue to deliver the workshop and get more people trained. So we now have training teams in um, multiple countries. It's growing in India and we have interest in France, and I'm pleased to say that we're having discussions and hoping to plan a workshop here um, in England uh, for this summer. So we'll have a two-day workshop, but we'll also build a training team here in the UK so that you'll be equipped then to grow the program from within here. If any of you are interested in knowing more about that, I understand that Claire would be your person to, to pass that on to or any of the uh, program organizers here this morning. We'd love to get as many of you engaged as possible uh, to make that happen. So uh, we share many, many common goals. We um, want to increase the global awareness about noise-induced hearing loss and our opportunities to prevent it. We want to share our strategies about hearing loss prevention and get them to be more readily accessible and used by a number of people. Um, and this is both in non-occupational and occupational sector. Um, I don't leave my ears at work when I go home at night. My ears go with me all the time and we need to bridge that um, in the people that we're educating and training. We need to start young. Every worker I ever talked to that had noise-induced hearing loss later in life lamented that no one taught them when they were young. So we need to start instilling that value of hearing at a young age. And ultimately, we have an opportunity to, to reduce the incidence of noise-induced hearing loss in tinnitus. And to do that, we need to build the partnerships that are necessary to bring the program into the schools, into the workplace, or into the military and organizations here in the UK. So I'll be here at break. Come meet Joe. Get your music players tested. Um, or I'd be glad to answer any other questions about the program. So thank you. Thank you. Just Fantastic. Let's take a couple of uh, uh, questions uh, from you, the audience. Um, have you had a good look at Joe? It's obviously President Trump is modelling his hairstyle on him. <laughs> Decided not to go for the purple. So, uh, any questions uh, from you? Or perhaps I could just kick off with one, which is kind of more a general one. I mean, there are an awful lot of people with hearing loss, but actually the noise-induced hearing loss proportion of that is relatively small. It's the age-related hearing loss that's so uh, important and such a big burden. So what are we doing in that area, and why aren't we focused on that? Well, I hope you've um, felt the kind of passion in us certainly banging the drum for prevention. 
and intervention. Um, but that is actually only one part of, of the wider kind of strategy and, and program of work that's ongoing. And we are, you know, others, colleagues here will talk to you later in the day about the, the other aspects that where you're intervening and active in across the system and across um, the whole kind of journey, clinical um, and health journey that people go through. So this is only one part, but obviously the, the noise-induced hearing impact does add to the age-related burden, so it's kind of tackling it from, from both ends as well. So, so it's certainly part of the wider programme, and you'll, you, I'm sure you'll all hear more about that mm. as we go through the day. Questions here? Mm. I've got my running shoes on, especially. <laughs> and tell us who you are. I'm Jean Strauss. Hard to explain who I am. <laughs> um, She's Jean Strauss. <laughs> <laughs> I've been reading a lot about the value of silence. And um, there are books about it and promoters of it. And it seems a positive way of going about noise reduction. Do you use it? I, I guess um, valuing silence, probably not directly in the program, but I think valuing your hearing so that you can enjoy silence is certainly something that can be addressed in that as well. Um, I, I work a lot with a, another group through our National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, and they have a, an award program called Safe and Sound. And one of the things that, that probably most of our award winners have been acknowledged for is noise control, for making things quieter and really trying to, to do that. But I think um, that's worthy of some more consideration about fitting that topic in. Thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, attending a, a conference that Deanna presented at a couple of years ago in the States, I mentioned before, the National Hearing Conservation um, Conference, they, they did a session on uh, what sounds we love and what, you know, what makes us feel good, what sounds make us feel good. And that, that was kind of a really positive, you know, actually we want to continue to enjoy these sounds that really excite us and make us feel good about you know, the world. So that, that's another spin on not just silence, but also enjoying sound. Can I, can I build off of that a minute? Okay, I want you all to answer this question out loud for me. What's your favorite color? Okay, what's your favorite sound? A few of you have some, good. But how old were you when someone asked you your favorite color the first time? Very young, right? How old were you when someone asked you your favorite sound? Today. <laughs> You're not going to tell me how old you are, are you? 61. <laughs> 61. Thank you. So I guess the point of that is we, it's not only valuing silence, but thinking about what sound brings to our lives. And if you ask people those questions, you will have fascinating conversations with people if you ask them their favorite sound. So I encourage you to, to maybe explore that more as you're together today. Okay, so that's your conversation for on the way home. <laughs> so here. I, yeah, yes. Okay, are we? Okay, interpreters work. Let's. We're doing a team. Uh, my name is Rubina. Um, I'm from Deaf Ed, and my question is to both of you. Does your research include deaf um, individuals from the deaf community? Because you've said there are deaf people who suffer from tinnitus as well. Also, deaf individuals may sometimes be fed up of hearing aids because they can cause tinnitus. Um, I have suffered from tinnitus myself, so sometimes if I take my hearing aids out, I do like silence. But however, if I do have my hearing aids in, I can suffer from tinnitus. So I just would like to know, um, your demographic it's included within your research? I think, um, I guess in terms of a specific demographic, uh, what our children with hearing loss are mainstreamed into the classrooms in the US, so there have certainly been kids involved if they're in that classroom in the research studies. Um, I don't, I don't think we've, um, we've, we've directly targeted a specific uh, study to look at those with hearing loss and then how the program works with them. But I will tell you, we've had um, attendees attend our workshop from what we call our commissions for the deaf, which are our local agencies that help um, connect those with hearing loss and deafness to the resources they need in the workplace or in their communities. And they have come and, and used a Jolene. They use it to 
to, as sort of the connection to teach others about hearing loss. So um, we'd welcome more discussion around that going forward. Yeah, and I think for the, for the prevention task and finish group, we're engaging with contacts at the Department for Education who lead on um, kind of pioneering, um, promoting uh, education for hearing impaired school children. So we'd like to bring that as into the, the program in, in England as well. Okay, we've got a question here. Hi there. On? Yep. 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 <laughs> uh, I'm Steve Dance. I represent the Royal Academy of Music and the Hearing Conservation Programme. And they're very young, and so it's a similar problem to you have, uh, but we don't ever call it noise induced. The young mm. people don't like to think of their music as <laughs> yes. noise, and the young people are who you are trying to reach out to. So maybe, as you have on your slide, call it sound induced hearing loss. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's not a negative message. Yeah, it's true. a neutral yeah. message. Yeah. My husband yeah. is a concert pianist who was at the Royal Academy of Music, who now has tinnitus. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I completely agree with you, and, and that conversation's gone on amongst us for, for many, many years. Um, so I like to use hazardous sound because it's not all sound is bad for your ears either. It's just the high level sound for, for too long of time. So I think that's, that's really worthy of consideration. And um, related to musicians, I've been interested in trying to adapt the program this afternoon. I'll talk a little bit about how we adapt it for some particular audiences. So um, I have a graduate student that's actually going to be looking at adapting the program for musicians in particular and how we tailor it to your needs and perspectives for that. Quick question on OAE, uh, Claire. How do you plan to get the use of it increased in the UK? Um, at Does the moment, do you think about it in newborns, but not yes. for adults? Yeah, I think it's um, just increasing awareness at this stage that there are there are other options available uh, for testing um, within workplace settings, within community settings, and that autoacoustic emissions is one possible. Um, kind of test to add to that, um, that program of intervention. So at the moment, it's really just engaging and raising awareness that it's, that it's available and the, the potential benefits that could bring. So that's where we're up to at the minute. Great. Okay, hi, I'm um, Paul Breckel, the Chief Executive at uh, Action on Hearing Loss. Um, just had a question um, about sort of the efficacy of the program. So you put up uh, a number of... Uh, the um, examples there of the studies, but if, we, if you could just give us the soundbite in terms of what it really does in terms of behaviour change. Okay. Um, yeah, great question. Um, in fact, at the workshop, we'll put on a whole session about the effectiveness and, and how we measure it. But in general, everybody starts out. Knowledge is pretty easy to change. <laughs> I've changed your knowledge this morning. So we have um, surveys that have been done pre and post program delivery that, that have questions specifically to knowledge to uh, questions about attitudes, beliefs, and then intended behaviors. We have not had funding to actually go out and observe actual behaviors, but we have some indication that um, if somebody says, I'll wear earplugs um, when I saw wood cut down a tree, then they likely are to do that. But that's the next step we'd really like to do. Um, so knowledge changes drastically. We go from maybe about 30% knowledge level in, I'm talking about the fourth, fifth grade age group here, up to 85, 90%. And then we come back three months later to see where we're at. And we do have some trail off there that'll drop them back down to about 70%. So that um, same peaked pattern shows up on all of our indices about attitudes and intended behaviors. The unique thing about the community-based program now is with supporting it within the schools and organizations and the kids all teach the parents in the community. The, the stores, radio stations have public service announcements. The newspaper did special articles. That has all served to keep that um, higher level performance up in the 85 to 95 percent range out at least for the three months and then Judy Sobel's gone back six months later and it's still been up there when those are continued so um, I think our efficacy looks real real good and those those values are very very similar if you look at New Zealand and Brazil they're almost identical which we were really surprised with but it translated well there great let's have a question over here 
Hello, my name is Reg Cobb. I'm from a local charity, uh, GDA. I've got three things that I would want to know about. Uh, first of all, is about the attitude of hearing loss. I'm talking about when hearing loss can affect a person's mental health, for example, on their physical health, and also training um, people how to understand and recognise a hearing loss. I mean, I'm profoundly deaf, so you know, I'm, <laughs> I've always had the hearing loss. But I'm wondering about the training of people. How is the medical profession doing that? My daughter was born, uh, and the audiologist told me, oh, good news, my daughter's hearing. And I thought, hmm, that's a little bit jarring, because I'm deaf, and it doesn't mean it's bad news. So I'm just wondering about how you're working with education, uh, education for the medical profession. Um, and kind of that negative behavior, breaking down that negative behavior. Um, because that can affect the child and their hearing loss and that can help their mental health state, really. So is that work covering those medical professions to reduce that negative stigma and label of hearing loss? Okay, you have done what we would call in radio the perfect segue. <laughs> the absolute perfect segue because